Hi everybody, welcome to our live stream for uh, Wednesday the 5th of August. Uh, we're talking to particular instructors and CFIs for the live stream. Welcome to sit in and listen, they might um, uh, learn some interesting information possibly. And of course, as always with our live streams, this is going to be a YouTube um, video and a Facebook post as well. So if you don't get the opportunity to sit down right now, then course we won't be offended if you go and watch it later. So uh, I'm Jill Bailey, Head of Operations for Recreational Aviation Australia, and with me is Neil, formerly Assistant Head of Flight Operations, uh, and now Head of Training and Development. Neil? Good uh, evening, everyone. Thanks, Jill. So what we're going to talk about, there's, there's four main topics for today, and they are particularly relevant topics for instructors and CFIs. So when I use the term instructors, I'm basically including instructors, seniors, CFIs, pilot learners, RACs, IT, anyone that actually does some form of training for our organisation, for our members. Um, we're going to be talking about the uh, COVID-19 extensions that have been issued by CASA and RAOs. We're going to be talking about how to convert pilots. It's a big topic uh, on its own. We're going to be also talking about student training records, the importance of them and the, the sorts of resources that are available. And then we're going to finish off um, with you know, the processes that are required for doing renewals uh, as a power of certificate holders. So let's get into it. Um, from the point of view of the COVID extensions, we're now in August. So anyone whose flight review is due in August now has an automatic two month extension on that flight review. If your um, if your uh, if your renewal was due up to the 31st of July, you had a three month extension. So some of you may actually be um, um, some of you may actually be outside of that extension period, unfortunately. And I'm just being told there might be some issues with my connection. So if I am dropping out, um, it could well be that there's lots of people in tomorrow downloading Netflix at the moment. Um, I've just got a graphic up there now that uh, it was actually designed from Neil. Uh, talking about uh, if you're in the blue bar there, your, your uh, renewal was due any time between 1st of March, 31st of July, you've got a three month extension. Um, now we're in August, um, you're now only uh, able to apply for a two month extension if your flight review was due in August and then from uh, April, uh, sorry, October to November, it's a one month extension. So those extensions apply automatically. There's nothing you have to do. However, if you are in those um, time frames for extensions, you do need to actually go and do a flight review in order to, to fly in that period. If you go outside your uh, flight review period and the extension, well, there's not much we can do. We've had a chat to CASA about that and um, there's not much in the way of extensions that we can go beyond that point with any of these uh, automatic extensions that have been applied for. So at that point, you just simply need to go and fly with an instructor. And if it's been that long, then really from a safety point of view, you probably should be going and flying with an instructor uh, anyway. Now we have got a really cool uh, graphic called a pilot currency barometer. And uh, I'm sure, whoop, Marette, look how quick she is. Very impressive in the background there. Uh, this is a resource on our COVID page and it's actually designed for pilots to be able to work out what their currency is. You can see there's, there's green, yellow and red bars depending on the hours on the left and the number of landings you've done. And depending on where you enter and cross over in the hours and landings, you'll arrive at either a green, yellow or red outcome. If you're red, well, you're going to be pretty rusty. You really should be going and, and doing a flight review with an ex examiner um, just for the sake of keeping yourself uh, current and compliant, if you can, obviously aware that there's some COVID issues uh, from our, our friends in Victoria. And we're thinking of you guys and girls down there in Victoria. Um, hang in there. I'm sure it'll all be worth uh, the, the short-term pain. Um, so use the currency barometer just to give yourself a bit of a guide as to how uh, rusty or otherwise you may be for your um, renewals. Now, speaking of renewals, we've got three wraps, which are Recreational Aviation Advisory Publications. So CASA has CAPS, RALs have wraps. We've got to thank Neil for the uh, abbreviation. He's our... Uh, abbreviation and marketing guru in the organisation for these sorts of things. So we've got wraps five, six and seven. They're available on the CFI portal for any instructor and they're also available on the member portal as well. Um, wraps five, six and seven are respectively what to expect from a BFR. 
So in other words, if you're a pilot certificate holder, what should be being done while you complete a, a flight review? Um, the six, sixth one is how to conduct a BFR. So that's guidance for our instructor community on how to actually complete a BFR, what sort of things you should be looking for for students, sorry, for pilots to do renewals. Um, and the final one is what to expect from your um, flight renewal as an instructor. And Lorette's just flashing up all of the wraps that we've got there. There's five, six and seven on our member portal in our knowledge base. So if you go into your member portal and even just search for wrap, or you go and find the knowledge base link, you'll find all of those wraps there. We spend a lot of time writing them and they are, I believe, pretty good guidance to, to assist. Um, have you got some points there or anything you want to add to that, Neil? Yeah, look, it's, again, they are very good resources and we'd encourage instructors particularly for this, uh, this live broadcast stream to be familiar with what pilots are hopefully reading about their BFRs so that when they conduct it as an instructor, they can marry the, their, their requirements as instructors to those of the expectations of the pilot. So that there should be no surprises when a pilot rings up for a BFR. Um, they're welcome to, to download them themselves. We'd encourage instructors if they've got access to it on their desktop to even send it while they make the booking for the BFR so that at the time um, of the conduct of that flight review, there's no surprises for either the candidate or for the instructor. So it just it means that the expectations are set very clearly at the start of the, of the process. Perfect. And that's the, the key thing because we do see a lot of misunderstandings, even at an instructor level, of what a flight review should consist of. And a flight review is uh, any process that someone is conducting to review your competency handling the aircraft. But a key difference for instructors is not just the management of competency of the aircraft, it's actually delivery of the theory briefing and delivery of the in-flight patter. That's a very key criteria that should be being managed by the examiner when they're assessing instructors or higher approval holders. And we often believe that what's happening is just a simple lap around the block. You know, yes, you can fly a plane, tick. That's not actually the requirement for an instructor renewal. An instructor renewal is that plus the assessment of the delivery of a ground briefing on a nominated subject and the actual flight assessment uh, of that delivery of, of that uh, subject. And what the examiner should be looking for is consistent language, consistent terminology, um, consistent uh, information being provided on the ground briefing all the way through to the flight flight information as well. So we've got a few yeah, people. Got um, thanks to Paul Strike and Paul O'Rourke, John Allen, Sport Aviation Tokemall and Tasmanian Aero Club for joining us. I love it when uh, we have uh, you guys and girls listening in. Um, and look, this is a really great way for us to communicate with our instructors when we can't get out there in the field and do the things that we would normally be doing, which, you know, we're all missing, actually, as an organisation. We kind of feel like we've been stuck in a little COVID bubble um, in and around our homes for a while, as I'm sure everyone else is too. Um, now, just for a bit of uh, clarity and, and confirmation too, when an, an examiner is conducting a flight review for either a pilot certificate holder or an instructor, uh, the examiner is the pilot in command. So that means that the hours that are logged are dual hours for the person completing the flight review and they're logged as pilot and command for the examiner conducting the flight review. So that's an important um, uh, point to differentiate because it, it does seem to uh, cause a bit of confusion for uh, for some of our uh, members. Now, I just want to add, Jim, no, sure, um, don't we, we don't have ICAS uh, in command under supervision in the RL system, so we'd simply operate in either a command or a dual environment. And, and, and logged accordingly. So for, for those uh, instructors that operate in a dual in a dual environment with CASA training, they might find that their their logging is different, but they need to be aware of those two categories only for RAIs. Yeah, that's a good point. Thanks, Neil, because ICAS is a, an area of potential confusion for our members, but from our perspective, there's no ICAS uh, requirement, log, logging requirement in our flight process at all. So if you're in the CASA world, you can review the CASA information, but from our perspective, no ICAS is, uh, is relevant. So if you're a pilot certificate holder and you've completed your flight review, if you're under an extension um, right now, um, it would actually still be processed as at the date that you've completed the flight review. So if your flight review was due on the 13th of March, you've been under a 90 day extension, you got to get to an ex examiner on the 13th of July and complete your flight review, as a pilot certificate holder, that's the date that your flight review has been completed at, and that will be a two-year anniversary uh, for the next renewal. So it will shift your date of your BFR if you've done it under an extension. However, for our examiners, in order to keep it as a, a consistent date, 
we actually, if it's done 90 days prior to the renewal date or in a 90 day extension during that 90 day after the, the uh, renewal date, it's processed at the renewal date. It stays fixed. So if your renewal is due on the 16th of March as an instructor and you do it up to 90 days prior to that, it will still be processed as at the 16th of March. And if you do it under our COVID extensions any time in the 90 days after that date, it will still be processed as at the 16th of March, just to keep that a consistent date for our examiners and instructors. We think that's uh, a, little, a little more helpful. Um, so moving on from there, uh, unless there's any specific questions that Moret's got from anyone on that, I'll move on to the next topic. So it's a, it's a big topic, converting pilots. And it's actually quite interesting that at the moment, um, with all of the pilots that are sadly out of work um, in the, the, the big pointy end of, of RPT, um, we're getting a large number of these pilots coming to us wanting to either reactivate uh, and a qualification they've had in the past or actually gain an instructor qualification, which is terrific. We've got a lot of very experienced people then that are coming to us uh, and wanting to become part of our organisation and I applaud that. Um, but obviously we've got to manage the expectations of those people. So we actually wrote RAP 11, uh, and we wrote it a while ago, um, and Marette's going to pop that up. She's so quick. Converting pilots. So let's talk first off about uh, the conversion of a pilot to a pilot certificate. So someone's come to us from the CASA world, from the GFA world, from the SAFA world, even from ASRA, and they have hours in an aircraft. Um, Section 2.13 of your ops manual, we'll see how quick Mered is, actually has very clear guidance. Oh, nice work. Thank you. In paragraph one and two, about what hours we will accept. So it's any dual and pilot and command hours gained in obtaining and maintaining a CASA or other organisations, aeroplane, helicopter, gyroplane. We've got airship in there. I'm not so convinced that that's necessarily relevant, but it's in there. Defence force qualifications and time, GFA gliding um, ratings or approvals, um, and any of those uh, information that's in that um, section there will be able to be used towards gaining the RL's pilot certificate. So you don't have to get that person to do 20 hours as you would if they were an ab initio candidate. Um, however, you have to make sure they're competent. So that's where getting the syllabus out, and I haven't given Moret a link to that, so don't worry about that, Moret. Um, the syllabus will be the point of reference that you'll use, and I suggest you actually reference with the, the candidate to show them what it is they need to demonstrate. So, Neil, that's right up your alley for the training and development uh, role. Do you want to have a quick chat about what sort of areas you might think in the syllabus world that someone might need to be uh, very aware of when converting someone? Well, it's a good point, Jill, and um, I, let's start with the administration. Uh, operating in a uh, recreational environment with RIOs as a member uh, implies um, restrictions under the civil aviation orders that, 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 a, that a converting pilot may and most likely is not aware of. Limitations in operation, day VFR operation, no night, no instrument, no aerobatics. So if you've got a converting pilot that's probably operated in these domains or operated in, in without the under under being under a specific civil aviation order, the first thing is to is to get them get them familiar with the limitations and also the privileges that you get operating under RAOs. Now we do test this in the converting pilot exam through some of the air legislation questions, but it's incumbent upon the examiners and the training instructors to make sure that the converting pilot is aware of the limitations and also the differences with maintenance releases versus maintenance records and and things like that because. Um, it, it's very easy if you spent 30 years in one system to just apply that thinking that that has to apply to RAIs and it's important that they know the differences. Once we've got to that, we then get up and get the joy of flying underway. And the expectation uh, for an experienced pilot who's got a lot of broad experience in defence or heavier aircraft is that they're possibly toy aeroplanes. And I think we're all seeing that the ultralight um, landscape change a lot over the last 20, 30 years. And we're seeing very complex aircraft um, I've actually had converting applicants that are A320, A330 captains telling me that some of the displays they see with the Dynons and Garmons that are in Garmons that are in RL's aircraft are more complex and more feature rich than what they have on their FMCs. So uh, spending some time in, in the unique um, avionics differences and some of the technologies that we have, but then focusing on the low inertia envelope and, and, the, and the elements that relate to loss of control, particularly for that converting pilot. They may or may not have great stick and rudder skills 
and they may or may not have done any dead reckoning in terms of navigation. While we can accept the endorsement recognition, it's important, as Jill mentioned before, that our that the pilots converting are assured by the exam to the examiner that they're competent in those exercises. I had a very experienced um, a Qantas captain, uh, a world record holder in, 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 in other disciplines as well. And we pulled out a, a VNC one day and he said, look, I don't use these charts. We just op we're just we operating up the flight levels. So the last time he pulled out a VNC or a VTC was probably 20 years ago. So it's it's there is this five-hour requirement and we'd encourage examiners and instructors to utilise that of our time or four hours and, and certainly the one-hour solo to actually em embrace some of the differences and also some of those skills that may have been not not sharpened up or not kept current over the last 20 30 years of that converting pilot's career so that's probably just a few uh, a few touch points that talk about admin operation and then the training challenges yeah i've got a couple of war stories too uh, i think if we probably opened it up we'd probably get some really good ones uh from the comments from people watching but uh, from the perspective of converting a pilot who was quite experienced i think in 737s back in the day we came in to do a crosswind uh, landing and he did not put the wing down into wind because if you do that in a 737, you'll scrape the engine to sell on the ground and you'll get into big trouble. So we drifted quite radically off the edge of the runway. Um, so once we, we embraced the concept of making sure that our light aircraft don't get drifted by dropping the wing into wind, uh, he was managing that aircraft really well. But it caught me a little by surprise and I suspect it caught him a bit by surprise as well. Um, now, one of the other ones that's quite interesting to convert is uh, is conversion of glider pilots. So one of the, the key things there is that they are absolutely aces at managing engine failures after takeoff, engine failures in the circuit, practice force landings, and they're generally quite good keeping the aircraft balanced. However, they've never taxied an aircraft. They've never uh, conducted a go around. They've never considered the effect of power managing engine um, management and they haven't ever tried to maintain constant height, constant heading for a navigation exercise because they're essentially thermaling and then setting course on a constant descent uh, all of the time. So they, uh, back in the day when I was a CFI uh, here in Tamora, we converted quite a few glider pilots. It was great fun, but I sat down um, at one stage and I noted 30 plus differences in what a glider pilot would manage in a gliding aircraft sailplane versus what would happen in a powered aircraft. So um, that was quite a lesson for me to not make assumptions. And I think that's part of the challenge for CFIs is to not to assume simply because someone's come from uh, a very qualified background that they are going to manage the aircraft in all phases. So you really do have to manage and assess in all phases, including navigation, um, particularly for, um, as I said, for uh, GFA conversions they haven't tried to simply do time over distance in the same way that we would in a powered aircraft. You got any war stories you want to add? Oh, just to just <laughs> add, to your, um, add to your thread on the glider pilots. Um, uh, PFLs have always been interesting when I've done, uh, when I've converted glider pilots because they come in uh, on final and go to reach for the blue hand or for the dive brakes and realise that they can't get rid of that height that quickly. And uh, so, yeah, they, they, it's just that operational, um, almost muscle memory in that case. You know, I actually had somebody go for the air brakes. You know, in a, and I said, no, you've got no air brakes and, you, and you're at the limit, are going to be at the limit of side slip. So what are we going to do? Um, so, yeah, look, uh, but it, it's, it's, I think, you know, for some of our instructors and examiners converting these pilots, whether they be rotorcraft or whether they be gliders or weight shift, um, in, uh, weight shift pilots, it's important to sort of, dip your head a little bit into their understanding of their operations because it'll give you a much better um, basis on which to focus um, the training elements that you need to focus on in that conversion process. Um, Jill was a classic case when we got her up in a trike. Um, she we, she suffered the, the typical, and it, wasn't, it doesn't always reveal itself, some of these things. These primacies don't come out until we actually load somebody up where the push-pull, you know, um, bar in, bar out type situation was almost reversed as some people think. Um, to the operation, but you know, these, it's important that we actually understand that because it helps us as examiners focus and give the maximum value to the converting pilot so that they can become that good rounded pilot across a number of different regimes. Yeah, that was a really good I encourage anyone to do some uh, flights in a micro light because it is a it's it's like a musician learning a different instrument, you know, the basics, but it's not the same. So uh, it was a really good experience, um, quite challenging, but good fun. And a big shout out to Mark Gentry for his help up there at Caboolture. Thanks, Mark. Um, I want to comment here from Paul O'Rourke, and I, I think you're right, Paul. It was our next point. 
Paul said, I think you need to focus attention on professionals converting to instructor in areas where there is little training going on. So I'm assuming from that, Paul, you're talking about people who have been at the pointy end of a, of a, uh, a large aircraft with lots of people behind them and then moving into an instructing world where they're flying with someone who is a complete ab initio candidate um, and then managing uh, that person, as in the instructor, uh, managing that candidate. Um, and we actually have some really good discussions with, uh, with a lot of our CFIs who convert across very experienced military pilots um, who have not necessarily trained ab initio candidates. They have converted people who are qualified pilots from a CT4 to a PC9, as an example, or onto an F111 or something very exciting. Um, that's a different world. It certainly requires a very specific set of unique skills and they're very good at structuring their delivery of those skills. But that's a very different world to actually putting someone into a Fox Bat or a Jabiru or whatever aircraft it happens to be and getting them to train someone who has probably never put their hands on the controls of an aircraft. So we do um, we do have some issues about perhaps having those people um, supervised uh, as an instructor, but there is an important reason for that, and that is to make sure that they are managing, handling that ab initio candidate, um, even though they've got maybe thousands of hours as a pilot in command in something bigger and faster. Um, and we are actually doing some modifications uh, uh, to our Ops Manual Issue 8. We'll be getting a draft out of that very soon uh, for people to put their uh, eyes over and come back with some uh, feedback. Uh, but part of that change will be a recognition of the fact that we might not need to have that candidate train three candidates and gain 75 hours instructing to be able to be upgraded to a senior. So there's some, some uh, revisions on that that we're planning which should help that and particularly for our military converting pilots um, with all of the experience that they've got. The, the government spent quite a few hundred thousand dollars training those pilots. Um, we just want to make it uh, safe, but we also want to recognise their, uh, their qualifications as well. Um, so, uh, yeah, looks like I've hit the right button there with uh, Paul. He's happy with that. Um, and g'day, Peter Wilson. Thanks for uh, listening in. So uh, when it comes to basically coming to the actual conversion process, I, I think there's two critical steps that any of our instructors should be looking at. First one is to just read section 2.13. It's, it's laid out so that paragraphs 1, 2, 3 and 4 apply to whatever conversion process. When you go from five to seven, um, particularly for the RPC. So uh, if Rhett can scroll down a little bit to paragraph five and seven on there, uh, and I'm sure everyone's got their own copies of this uh, document, there it is. So in order to get a pilot certificate, no matter what qualifications we're talking about, they have to be a financial member of RAOs. Now that sounds like it should be a no brainer, but unfortunately we have had some converting pilots come through who haven't been a member of RAOs which means that the, the CFI has sent that person solo. Um, that person is now in breach of the ops manual because they're not a member um, and they potentially have put their insurance at risk. So very, very important to use the CFI portal to make sure that they are a financial member of REOs, particularly that they haven't just signed up as a temporary member, which doesn't allow them to fly solo, as our uh, instructors would know. They have to then be issued with a student or converting pilot certificate, which would happen as part of the process of becoming a member. And they have to undertake whatever dual training is required. So as we've said before, Neil and I have both experienced very um, experienced pilots being converted. Doesn't mean that they necessarily handle that aircraft to the level of competency that we would hope would be the case. So that four hours can be very, very valuable uh, training time and it can also be an opportunity to go through the syllabus to make sure that they have met all of the requirements for the issue of a pilot certificate. They need to do one hour solo um, and then basically uh, provide logbook entries for all the hours that they're trying to uh, to claim and uh, don't need the entire logbook, just the, the last sort of four pages would be fine um, generally and then a complete a flight test or an assessment of some sort. So uh, 2.13 is the go-to section. Um, and there, there are, in, in paragraph seven that Marit's got up there, there are some very specific areas that we want people to focus on when they're converting pilots, which talks about management of the, the light inertia of our aircraft, the um, onset and recovery of stalls, because uh, the aircraft will handle quite differently to some of the aircraft that have been managed by these very experienced uh, pilots. Um, and the high drag that can occur, particularly in things like the good old thrusters and drifters. 
So, um, Neil, have you got anything else to add uh, in there, uh, particularly before I move on to instructors? Uh, just for examiners particularly, just um, being clear in, in the assessment of the logbooks, what constitutes um, time, aeronautical experience in an aircraft that can be registered with RAIs. Um, a lot of people quote 152, Tomahawk, Grum and Tiger time. And, uh, we, you know, we do have an exemption for, for grade one uh, CFIs where we'll accept it, but for, for any pilots and converting instructors, we, you know, it, it has to be in an aircraft that's basically LSA or an aircraft that might have been historically a VH, a VH registered ultralight, like a Skyfox or something like that. So it's, it's important. We do get a lot of calls on that, but we often get a lot of applications where when we look at it and we see the logbook entries, they don't correlate to the to the to the uh, to the five hours. So they might have done two hours in total, assuming that they've had like five or six hours in 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 what they thought were ultralight aircraft, but they're not. So it can only be in an aircraft if we're going to going to minimise below that five hours and just work on the competence equation. It's got to be in an aircraft that can be registered with RAOs, which means subsequent. Yeah, essentially. That's the very clear, um, easy way to manage whether that Tomahawk or 152 fits that category because they, they don't. They're not a 600 kilo max takeoff weight aircraft. Um, however, if they've been flying a Piper Cub um, and it's been VH registered, happy days. Uh, very happy to, to accept that time towards the uh, minimum requirements. And then it's just a matter of just assessing their competence at that time. So finishing off on paragraph uh, 2.13, the paragraphs uh, beyond that point, when we get to uh, 9, 10 and 11, as an example, are the paragraphs that are relevant for our instructors uh, converting across someone who has an instructor rating. Thanks, Marit, you are all over this. Um, so again, we will accept uh, a, a qualification from another organisation. And basically in, in 9B, there is, uh, 9B, C and D, there are a number of pathways so 9A is the simple RAOs way. If you have had 100 hours PIC um, in an RAOs, excuse me, Group A or B aircraft, great, go and do an instructor course and, and meet all those requirements, you'll be issued with an RAOs instructor rating. If you've got some other experience in other aircraft, um, then very clearly in B, it says you need 150 hours total aeronautical experience. So that's in whatever form of aviation you've done and then uh, 75 hours pilot and command in a recognised aircraft of the same group. So that's the sub 600 kilo we're talking about. And there is a provision um, that allows us to, to reduce that to 25 hours on application. So we're not gonna make you go and do 75 hours if you've got sufficient experience in something that um, we're happy that uh, will meet the criteria. In paragraph C, if you've got a recognised qualification as an instructor, um, and you've actually done ab initio instructing, again, it's a, a very simple five hours PIC in an RAOs aircraft. Um, so that's not too hard to, uh, to amass, particularly if you're familiarising yourself with that category of aircraft to start instructing. You want to go out and do some hours in the aircraft to really feel competent and confident in it. And paragraph D, if you've got an instructor rating that's brand new and you've never actually instructed, then there, there are a slightly different amount of requirements um, including 10 hours PIC in an RAOs aircraft. So I think those pathways are reasonably clear. Um, it, it shouldn't uh, cause too much issue. But again, we encourage CFIs to call us, but we really would appreciate it if you read through those paragraphs and see if you can find the answer there first. And if you've got one of those challenging ones, and I do get those challenging questions from people on occasions, Neil and I sometimes get our heads together and chew on it for you know five, 10 minutes to try and work out what the appropriate processes are. So it's not always easy. Um, but if you can have a look at those sections in the 2.13 um, converting pilot requirements, it will make life a bit easier for all of us, I think, and you might find the answer. If you can't find the answer there, check out RAP 11, because in RAP 11 on some of the later pages, there's a heap of scenarios. So we've actually come up with some real world examples of, I'm a pilot, I'm an instructor, I've got military experience, I've got gliding experience, blah, blah, blah. So about page five, Marette, if you scroll down on that document, you'll see a heap of scenarios. Um, there we go, a little bit further down. There we go. So scenarios, real world scenarios, and there are something like four or five pages of those. So we did spend a bit of time trying to give some examples of PPLAs or SAFA. I've got to do some amendments here. I've got to apologise to our sister organisation, SAFA. It still references HGFA. 
Um, they uh, went and changed their name. We've got to go and change the documentation to reflect that. Um, so uh, I think that probably manages that whole section. Neil, are you happy there? Is there anything you want to add? Uh, no, I think you've, look. It's always a, a very customised area, and and I think if you've pointed as you've pointed out, there are always unique situations. Um, if is we don't mind if you contact us at the operations team, um, but yeah, look at the resources first, and then if you still get stuck, give us a call after you've been through all the resources. Uh, there will always be a situation where a pilot might have. Um, some unique credentials or not have evidence for something that we can always assess and Jill's got the authority to look at those things so yeah it's uh, and we are getting a lot of converting pilots as as we mentioned at the start of the show there um, there's a there's a big insur insurgence into into RAOs partly some of it of late has been COVID related um, we do get a lot of grade instructors that have gone through their grade three commercial FIRs and have an instructor an hour in terror and um, they're looking for work and they, 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 they we welcome them into the RL system but we need to make sure that, that, that they're going to apply the level of competency in management of the aircraft with a student on board I might add that, that we need to get safe flight outcomes and, and good training outcomes. Yeah, no, that's really uh, really good points, Neil. Thank you. And got to be a bit of a shout out there. Ross Costanzo from Mid Coast Flying is watching. Rob Glenn, our Aero Club, and um, Wisey from uh, Dubbo uh, with uh, Dan Compton. G'day, guys. Thanks for joining us. Hey, um, guys. The last thing we want to talk about is is a, it, it can be a very boring subject, but it's really, really important student training records. So, Neil, maybe do you want to start off talking a little bit about what we're looking for? And Marette might. Um, pop up, thank you, the CFI portal where uh, the uh, GSP is available as an Excel spreadsheet and a PDF to download. And uh, Marette, maybe you can pop up that graphic of the GSP while Neil gives a bit of a, an overview of what we're looking for with student records. Yeah, thanks, Jill. Um, look, the, the student training record is a requirement. It's it's an actually mandatory requirement in the operations manual for all flight training organisations to maintain a student training record um, and to keep that record or a copy of such for at least five years. And when requested by another flight school, if the student was to move upon written request, that they should provide a copy of that training record um, completely to another school. So that's just this heads up about the fact that we have to have a training record. Um, the training record has got to have a number of key elements that are outlined in the operations manual and the generic student progress sheet is a, a document that's been built up by previous operations managers and Jill and, uh, and Zane Tully did a lot of work in this area and I think it even goes back to Mick Poole. Uh, we, it's, it's an iteration that we keep um, adapting but it's been, served us well for the last five years and I would say that roughly 25 to 30 percent of our flight schools are using the generic student progress sheet as the standard document. Some have modified it slightly but essentially the, um, the summary page and the elements in it are a great reference point for any instructor or CFI to pick up and see where a student's at with the key elements that we need to cover. I think the first thing we need to point out is that the syllabus of flight training um, goes way back to 1939 and the sequence of delivery is important and, and, we, and we grade that out in both the syllabus and the flight training record so that the student builds on skills from simple to complex and from known to unknown in a way that actually immerses them in a, in a, in a very abbreviated, let's say 20 hours, training system. So to shortcut, change around, put people in circuits before they've actually built a good understanding of those, what we call those core six lessons, right up to stalling and uh, slow speed management, uh, is probably not doing the, the student a great deal of uh, service. And it's important that we follow that sequence of delivery. Uh, the next thing is, is that we need to make sure that throughout all the sequence of development for a student, that they're competent to a standard. Now, the standards are referenced in the syllabus of flight training. For solo, it's standard three, which says under supervised and controlled circumstances, a student pilot can, uh, can make decisions um, where, where the parameters have been managed by a supervising instructor or CFI. Standard two says that in uncontrolled environments, the student can manage any abnormal situation. So that'll include all emergencies, whether they be within the circuit or outside of the circuit. And so there is a clear difference in how we assess that. And we use the flight tolerances as the basic metrics. It's in the flight instructor manual, which will be integrated to the syllabus. But it's important we build that progression of competency, time and the lesson type to get to a point uh, where we, any of your instructors as a CFI, 
and any of your fellow instructors can, can move this document online or in a hard copy so they can see as they progress to a pre-brief on a lesson what they need to do with that student. And, and the student should be engaged in that process. So the GSP and the training record is something that should be a shared document, should be supervised, managed uh, and overseen by the CFI, should be used by the instructors and it should be shared with the student so that there is a common understanding of where we're at, where we need to develop, what's still to come, how, st how certain segments build on others. Now the GSP, um, it basically embraces all those elements, including the, the tabulation of all the times that are required. It also takes in some of the key dates, uh, the membership um, requirement after three hours of flight, and also uh, the pre-solo exam, and then again, all the other exams that are required before flight tests. So they're actually in the right-hand side of the document, you can see there. The codes up the top reference the codes that are in uh, in the syllabus of flight training. And you'll see there was an earlier iteration where we had forced landings uh, before solo. That's been now moved in the latest version. So if you've, if you've archived an old version, we've put forced landings as opposed to engine failures in circuit after solo, given that that's an area, a training area solo requirement that they can actually perform a forced landing PFL and a precautionary search if necessary. So that's basically an overview. We've got a very good video that Jill um, and I put together. Jill's narrated it uh, on, on how to actually work through a working example of the GSP. We're not saying to schools, you must use this, but where you have an alternate system, the elements that are in the GSP should be referenced. Uh, that being the sequence of flight lessons, the date time recording of the instructors, the progressive hours, and of course the competencies, and also that key assurance that certain requirements that are in the ops manual are met, such as pre-solo exams and medical requirements when necessary. Awesome, thanks Neil, that was a really good summary. Um, look, in broad terms, just to give some assurance to our CFIs, and I can see there's a few that have put some comments up that they're using the GSP or a variety or variation thereof. There's any number of student training record systems out there. And obviously for those schools that are operating in the dual part 61 or 141 environment, the CASA requirements will be very um, acceptable to RAOs, other than the fact that the um, competencies are exactly reversed. Um, but we are quite happy to, to accept that. One of the key things, um, two key points I wanted to put forward about that the generic student progress record has been um, tested, I guess that's the correct word, tested in a coronial environment. So uh, from the point of view of, of unfortunately accidents do occur, um, we had a, a CFI that had used the GSP, um, had a fatality with a student or a, a pilot later qualified as a from a student, um, and that student training record was reviewed as part of the coronial process. The coroner was very, very impressed with the level of detail that's possible in that in that document and the fact that it very clearly uh, shows the competencies were met. But one of the key areas to be aware of um, in the comments section particularly is if you identify a deficiency, and a typical one would be insufficient rudder to keep the aircraft balanced during turns or on climb out or wherever it happens to be. If you discover there's a deficiency in record, um, you must uh, obviously correct that deficiency and record the deficiency as corrected. So there was quite an a interesting um, accident that Neil investigated, which wasn't a fatality. Uh, the pilot managed to uh, land the aircraft on a soccer field from, from memory. But when we actually went through the student record at the time, uh, all the way through the record was a note that the student wasn't keeping it in balance. And aircraft was not kept balanced uh, during climb out, during turns, the rudder was not being used effectively. And that actually turned out to be a factor in the inv investigation and the, re the reason for why that accident occurred. And you know, if, without going into specifics, maybe you could give a bit of an overview of, of that investigation just to give some context for why it's important to identify yeah. and correct deficiencies. Thanks, Jill. Yeah, look, yeah, a Swiss cheese model as, as it normally is. Um, there was a fuel management plan, not a fuel checking process that was robust in first place. There was minimal fuel on board, but enough for the flight. Um, unbalanced flight with a passenger on board taking photos, doing a lot of turning, led to um, led to unporting of a fuel tank, which then, because it was sustained, um, meant the catch tank didn't have five litres of fuel in it and the thing just starved. Uh, and um, yeah, and it was a goal for it was a goal for the white team at uh, Runcon Golf Course, if I recall. But yeah, um, 
and interesting because there was a lot of innuendo that it was an engine failure and of course we worked out it was fuel starvation but it was the root cause of of balance management uh, combined with some um, minimum fuel requirements that the manufacturer later in, in added in terms of information in their POH. But uh, yeah, look, uh, rudder management and, and balance management are key issues in the training syllabus. Um, different aircraft, I know a Eurofox, so I get every time I get in a Eurofox, I've got to recalibrate my feet um, compared to some other aircraft. That our, our aircraft tend to be short moment. They can, be, they can have either very powerful rudders or not very powerful rudders. And it's important that we actually um, work with the student to go through that process. And if we see deficiencies, we actually identify the root cause of those deficiencies and, and get them through. We had an instructor application the other day where an instructor was recommending to their CFI solo and the assessing CFI noted that they were flying unbalanced in all the turns in circuit. So, we, yeah. you know, we, we've got to make sure that... that, that at the, you, our examiners and our CFIs and our flight schools, they are the, the, the measure, they are the guardians of the standard. Jill and I don't get to see these things every day. We go out and do instructor renewals from time to time and we run professional development. But uh, the examiners in the field that we're talking to tonight, you are the guardians of the standard. So we need you to understand it, um, clearly interpret it and apply it and, uh, and, and, um, and hopefully get our pilots to a high, the highest possible standard while still having fun. Well said. Yep, very good. Uh, and that leads us uh, quite nicely to our final topic. Um, so one of the key responsibilities for instructors is not just sitting there in the aircraft, which is a key enough responsibility, managing the flight, but managing the student record and then managing the recommendation for issue of whatever the qualification happens to be. So whether it's a pilot certificate, an endorsement, a rating or an approval, um, it's very important for us to then, oh, thank you. Yep, Statement of Duties and Responsibilities for CFI. Paragraph four, uh, paragraph five. No, uh, it's there somewhere. In 1.06, actually. Um, uh, and it's paragraph six. <laughs> I'll get there eventually. So paragraph six says, recommend to the ops manual. Oh, no, we don't want to talk about that one. We don't want to re <laughs> remove or vary. There's a paragraph in there that talks about uh, the CFI recommending the issue of via the correct form um, to RAOs for the issue of pilot certificate endorsement or as a PE for a uh, instructor rating or um, approval. Um, and one of the chief frustrations for our staff um, is to have to ring up CFIs or instructors and say, you didn't complete the form, you've missed a date, you've missed a, a tick box, you haven't put hours in, you haven't supplied us data, you haven't given us copies of training records, particularly going back to our converting pilots, we don't have copies of um, the logbook or a copy of the licence that you're trying to recognise. That stops the application in its tracks. And uh, previously, we've been saying to people, once the uh, issue of the endorsement, pilot certificate, rating approval, whatever it happens to be, is entered into the logbook, that person can actually exercise those privileges from that moment. I'm actually going to be a little bit dogmatic here. Um, and I'm actually going to say that from this point forward, putting you guys on a bit of uh, an alert, if the paperwork is not processed appropriately, and we do have a commitment to process it within 10 working days and our staff do an incredible job. And big shout out to Letitia, to, to Candice and Janelle at the moment are doing a, a wonderful job processing these, uh, these um, paperwork that we have. But a chief frustration is the lack of completion of that paperwork. And if that paperwork is not complete and a pilot certificate or whatever the endorsement can't be issued, um, we're going to say that you cannot exercise that privilege. And that's that's a uh, that's a hard line that we're starting to put in into our processes. And I know it's contrary to what you've been told by us before. But it's a, a way to impress upon you the importance of completing that paperwork, um, and and that is a critical importance for anyone from a senior instructor and above when they're issuing a, an endorsement, a pilot certificate, etc. Um, so just take some time to read that paperwork, make sure the paperwork has all of those boxes ticked, all of the areas that are for signature are signed, they're completed, the hours are completed, and any copies of documentation are, are provided. So it removes the frustration from particularly Tish at the moment. And I was actually going to ask Tish to, to join in just to pop in at this point, but she's uh, had to go uh, uh, 
back back home from work. So uh, unfortunately, you don't get to see the lovely Tish, but she is the one that will be ringing you, um, and we'll have other staff obviously doing the same, saying, "Hey, uh, you haven't checked the box. You haven't filled out the credit card information correctly. You haven't uh, finished a, a date. You haven't given us the aircraft registration. Whatever it happens to be, that has paused that paperwork from being processed. The delay from that point." is going to be on you guys and girls. It is not going to be on RAOs. But once we get that information back, we are going to do our darndest to process that as quickly as we possibly can. However, the delays that are going to be as a result, we've had some applications that have been delayed months because the CFIs haven't responded to, to our staff members. And I've actually, myself and Neil and, and uh, soon to be Jordan, have had to actually interact with the CFI and say, you yeah, know, come on, please finish the paperwork off. So uh, just as a, a bit of a heads up, the policy uh, shift from, organ from the organisation in, uh, in general terms, we want to support our membership as best we can, but if that paperwork's not complete, we're not going to be processing that uh, application and that person cannot exercise whatever that privilege is, whether it's a passenger endorsement and they've got their family lined up to go flying that weekend. Sorry, it's not going to happen until we issue that, uh, that paperwork. Um, and the easiest way to know that's been done there's a number of ways. This is the even better part. First off, the staff have a process to email that person the certificate. So once their pilot certificate has been processed or their instructor voting or whatever, they will get an email copy of their new qualification um, via email and it, it's, it's instantaneous once it's processed by the organisation. You can check in the CFI portal. That's the wonderful resource we've got there for all instructors, all 480 plus instructors in the organisation uh, the CFI portal, there it is. Um, if you don't have a login, contact the office. We'll give you a login. If your login's not working, contact the office. Uh, you can check the membership qualifications, membership um, currency. You can check their BFR date. You can check the aircraft registration. You can do everything you need to do from a compliance point of view in that CFI portal. And then, thank you, Marette, you're in my mind, the member portal, there is uh, the ability for that person to actually check that they have all the qualifications they should have. Um, because occasionally there may be a, an endorsement that's not uh, processed for some reason. So it's always worth referring that applicant to the members portal and say, go and check out your qualifications and make sure you've got everything you should have. <laughs> and then finally, I should put a plug in for the members app because we, uh, we don't talk enough about that, but the members app, which I'm just going to log into, should have had it pre-prepared. Um, here's my pilot certificate. It's not going to necessarily be easy to read, but there it is on my phone with all the information that is relevant to my uh, pilot certificate information. Uh, here's my aircraft registration information. So everything that I need to know, uh, it's not very easy to read, sorry about that. There's my, uh, there's my aircraft registration. So every aircraft that is registered to a member uh, is on that member's app. In the home page, there's a heap of um, uh, information. There's a uh, unmanned aircraft flying in Wide Bay. Uh, that was uh, uh, information about our Mad Hall live stream. Um, so there's a whole heap of information in there and the, the members and instructors and CFIs can use that as well. If you don't have it yet, go to the App Store, download it, got Android and Apple variations. Um, uh, I've been talking a lot, Neil. Is there anything I've missed? Anything you want to add? Uh, no, I, I, I think to back to the training, um, point of view, it's important to have a pre-brief and a debrief with the student so that as you go through a lesson element, there's there's clarity as to whether or not the student's going to progress through to the next lesson. If they're not, what areas need to be worked on that are fundamental to moving on to that next lesson. Um, we often see, I get feedback quite a bit from students and uh, also I get, uh, and it's great, I get calls from instructors saying, I'm having trouble with the student, we're in circuits. You know, we're up to eight or nine or 10 hours in circuits and they're having trouble landing or we're and I think you eloquently put it that we stall an aeroplane every time we land. And so the stalling exercise ties directly to the landing exercise. So to spend more time and get that visualization, that control authority feel, and the, and the secondary and further effect understanding at height, at height actually aids you in the landing process and can sometimes reduce some of that circuit time. And students, as we all know, get very dejected if they spend hours and hours and hours digging, digging trenches around the circuit. Uh, it's great practice. I don't mind it. I love doing circuits, but for a student, they're trying to progress through. And I think 
if we as examiners can find those key areas where we know that they're going to get value and they're going to improve, like balanced turning, good referencing before turning, good speed management with attitude, if they get those things sorted out and we as examiners pick those key points up, then we actually help the student progress through their flying journey and, and get that get that magic fist, fist pump in the air when they go solo or get the pilot certificate. So It's an awesome feeling. I can still remember my first solo um, being scared as hell, but also very excited and the feeling of uh, being on downwind and looking across at that empty seat and realising it was on me to get that sky fox back on the ground. It was a very cool moment and it is a very amazing achievement for anyone. And that's one of the things we need to remember beyond all of these discussions about making sure the paperwork's right and the training record's recorded. We are doing some amazing things when we teach people to fly. Um, and it's, it's a joy to be able to do that. So I guess a uh, couple of shout outs there. We've got a comment from Rob Glenn, the CFI portal's great. Thanks, Rob. Yep, we think it's pretty darn good. It's got a whole heap of resources we haven't talked about for a while as well. If you haven't gone into the CFI portal, go and check out the CFI resources and see how quick we're ready to get that up, maybe. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and from Ken Jaleff down there in, in Victoria, stay Thank safe. You. Well, get well, away. Um, thanks yeah. for the feedback. Um, I, I suppose we throw this open to questions now. If there's anything that's uh, that's a burning question from an instructor or, or even a member, um, there's some topics, obviously, that we uh, will re refer to uh, later streams. And, and we've got some great stuff happening with uh, J uh, Jared. Uh, in the airworthiness uh, area um, for aircraft, etc. He and Darren, uh, the duo there, the dynamic duo, do a wonderful job in the airworthiness area. We'll be doing another live stream with them soon. Um, Michael and Mick, um, our other dynamic duo, the CEO and the chair, do a lot of live streaming just to give some member information. So, look, this is a great way for us to interact with you guys and girls. Um, love it when you give us questions. Uh, there's nothing there other than just... Uh, um, some good feedback and really appreciate the fact that you guys and girls have logged in and, and are watching. Um, John uh, Benson, can an instructor access the CFI portal? Yeah, it, an instructor can, John. It's it's a, It originally started as access for the CFIs and we realised what a wonderful tool it was for the entire instructor cohort. So any instructor, um, as soon as they be, become an instructor, should be given access and it's part of our process that they are. However, if you've lost your... Um, uh, your login, you simply use the email address that you use to access your member portal, um, put that in and, and click the forgot password um, link and it will actually give you a temporary password to get you back in and then you obviously change that uh, that password from there. So every instructor, 480 plus people in the organisation have access to that CFI portal. We didn't rename it because it, it was originally a CFI resource only but it, the instructor should be able to grab hold of the wraps, the briefings, the, the flight instructor reference manual is there, is a, a downloadable PDF. There's a whole heap of information on that portal and always happy to get feedback and um, information from people about other things that we could put on there, uh, potentially uh, to help you guys and girls out as well. Uh, Andrew just popped up a comment about the ability to fly during COVID. Very topical, especially uh, for you guys in Mildura. Um, and g'day to Adrian, uh, Richardson and Andrew. Um, yeah, look, it's uh, it's a challenge at the moment with what's going on in, across the country. We've got different restrictions in different states. We've got borders being closed, borders being opened up, quarantining, etc. I can't possibly keep on top of that. No one can. But we have got links on our website to take you to the appropriate state uh, Department of Health guidelines. Uh, I know that the uh, Victorian government, thanks for it, that's the uh, COVID page there on our website, it's got a heap of stuff. It's got information about our links to the various states. It's got information about how to manage your aircraft if you're in lockdown for a while and have to maintain it. The pilot currency barometer's there. There's information about the extensions. Uh, and there's information about how to prepare your aircraft for storage if you're going to be out of the air for a while. There's some very important support there for Lifeline. You know, this is a challenging time for all of us. There's uh, e economic issues. There's personal health challenges. Uh, it's a really stressful time. So we need to make sure we look after each other, support each other. Um, there's some links there for Lifeline and Beyond Blue and other things. If you do feel stressed about all this uh, information, you know, please go and talk to someone. Um, you know, we're not professional counsellors, but I'm happy to lend an ear to anyone that's struggling at the moment with the issues that we've got. 
with COVID and the economic issues on our businesses. Um, RALs is, is managing to uh, to tread water at the moment um, and we're very grateful for the support of our members who are continuing to renew their memberships even if they may not be able to fly for a month or two while the restrictions are in uh, in place. Um, so that's probably enough about the COVID stuff. We've got one more question there from John Benson again. Uh, no, sorry, from Rob Glenn. Exam for converting pilots? Absolutely, there is a specific exam uh, for converting pilots, which is called the converting pilot exam. Um, and it's in the package of information that you would have gotten from 2016. Um, and there was an update in November 2018. And that converting pilot exam effectively rolls together a majority of questions from air ledge, radio, HF, VAK and navigation. So it's uh, also got some questions specifically about RAO's requirements as Neil spoke about earlier. A lot of our pilots converting from other organisations get trapped a little bit about things that RLs pilots can do, can't do, should do, must do. Uh, the converting pilot exam is uh, is the way to make sure that they understand those uh, particular limitations, etc. Uh, have you got anything to add, Neil? I feel like I've been waffling on yeah, a bit. Uh, yeah. <laughs> to cover, and we appreciate everybody uh, hanging in there, and uh, we, you know, we want to get back to PDPs, but right now. Um, and, and, and see you face to face. But right now, this is a great mechanism. And two things I want to just talk about in terms of the challenges of COVID-19. It's causing schools to actually rethink how they provide and integrate, interact with their students. So I'm seeing a lot of schools embracing their own online technologies. RAOS is racing to get our exams through a, a, an arrangement with Bob Tate online so we can pull all our exams online. So you'll be able to, we'll get away from this paper-based exams where we can and we'll be able to get immediate marking and we won't have all these um, these archaic issues that have served us well, but we need to move forward. But I'm already seeing schools that are adopting that themselves. We've certainly um, got a lot of schools that, that are actually looking at video presentations and video briefings. We're seeing a lot of flight sequences being demonstrated. Uh, RAOs has got special access to uh, one of uh, our more leading um, video producing organisations with GoFly Online, um, looking at the student training pro process. And these are great things for your students to link to free of charge and immerse themselves in those areas where they might be challenged to get out to the airfield or there may be some issues, not just because of weather, but certainly with the COVID-19 restrictions. So it's, uh, it, it's time for innovation. Um, while, they, while we have these restrictions. So we're looking at the opportunities that COVID presents and we just have to live with the, the reality that it's going to probably be a long-term adjustment in the way we operate. And it'll vary from state to state. So it's very hard for us to give one um, one size fits all answers and we, 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 we understand that the frustration sometimes that we can't tell you whether or not you've got to physically distance in a cockpit or not. Uh, and But but we understand that the, the hygiene practices I've seen in the field in the last few months when I've been out, our schools are really adap adapting to it well. And um, it's, it, it, you know, it's challenging, but they've, they've been innovative at the same time. And I, I don't, I'm not aware of a single pilot case where we've had in our training operations where there's been a COVID case that I'm aware of, so. Yeah, well, hopefully we never see that. Um, that would be an interesting challenge. But look, there, there are a whole heap of resources still on that COVID page for how to manage the in-cockpit um, processes, temperature checks, uh, recording student information, uh, checking that they're, uh, they're feeling fit and well, applying the I'm safe processes, et cetera. Um, and a bit of a shout out there, Ron Lawford, thanks. Uh, what a great session, he says. Um, where to find the members app from John Allen. Um, oh, Marette, you're all over it. The app is available through the App Store and Google Play. So you just simply search for, I think the correct search is actually Recreational Aviation Australia rather than RAOs to find mm. the correct app. But it's got our logo um, on the, the download section there. Oh, Dave Donald found it by typing in RAOs. You guys are all over it. I've got a bit of a personal uh, uh, follow-up there from Greg Davies, uh, thanking us for the for the time and uh, and information. There's some uh, info from Marit on the uh, app, um, and it is a really cool uh, bit of a process. There, you can also search for uh, your closest school if you're travelling or you're uh, in an area you're not familiar with, assuming you can leave the state with COVID-19 restrictions. Um, uh, Nigel Wittenhall, hey, how are you going? Uh, I think that's about all we've got there in comments. Paul O'Rourke, he's looking forward to seeing a, a seminar at Cobden. Paul, we would love to get out there and we're looking at how we can manage that. 
Um, it's just with the state of flux that we're in, we haven't uh, looked at committing to any uh, seminars, etc. Um, I know the White Gum Farm guys are, are planning to have a, an event soon. We'd love to be over there and support it, but WA is obviously um, quite rightly closed its borders <laughs> and kept itself in a little bubble. Um, so we can't get there, but we, uh, we're offering some support in other ways. Um, I think that's probably about all the comments um, that we've got. Uh, look, I'd like to thank everyone for, for taking the time to to uh, attend. We've just clicked over an hour. I can't believe we've been talking that long, Neil. Um, I suppose the two of us can talk underwater with a mouthful of marbles pretty easily. Um, this will be available on raaus.com.au, uh, on YouTube, on Facebook. Uh, you can watch it any time. Um, and look, anytime you've got questions that you want asked, send them through to, uh, to our, um, uh, what's the correct address there for our uh, questions, Marette? See how quick she is at typing. Nice. Members at raaus.com.au. Uh, send your questions through. We'll try and include them into a live stream um, where possible. Uh, and look, we really enjoy these processes. We have a ball talking to you uh, guys and girls out there in RAL's land and look forward to hopefully seeing you out there in the real world soon. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you.